Hello again, everybody. Today we're going to talk about treacher collins syndrome. This is a genetic issue that affects the face, and uh, this is rare. It's autosomal dominant, and when you think autosomal dominant, you think this has to be easy to, to, to diagnose, because if it's autosomal dominant, it means the parent must have it, and so family history has got to be there. This is an easy one. In reality, though, this is a syndrome that has a wide degree of manifestations, uh, a wide degree of severities. And so it is very possible for a parent to be affected to carry this autosomal dominant trait, but be so unaffected that they don't know that they have it. And because this only affects your outward features, um, apart from hearing loss, which is really a result of the outward feature issues, uh, you can carry this and not know it. Uh, so there are cases, indeed 40% of cases, that are hereditary, and a lot of them the parent doesn't even know that they have treacher collins syndrome uh, because it's so mild. Uh, so this is strictly a physical disease. It does not affect cognition or any other spheres of development. There can be issues with hearing, and in a lot of cases there are issues with hearing, and uh, the child will require a, an implant. Uh, but other than that, this does not affect cognition. Okay, so if there are issues with hearing and it's not diagnosed, then that can appear to affect progress in school, and you might think that that's affecting cognition. But organically, this does not affect cognition or any other spheres of de development. This is just strictly a physical disease of the face and of the ears. It is rare. It affects 25 to 50, 1 in 25 to 50,000 live births. So uh, when you look at uh, you know, the rarity of, of these genetic diseases that we've been talking about, this is definitely on, on the more rare end. Uh, it's also referred to as mandibulofacial dysostosis or Franchetti's syndrome. Uh, like I said, this is autosomal dominant with variable penetrance. It tends to get worse from generation to generation. Um, 81 to 93 percent of Treacher Collins patients will have a deletion or mutation of a gene that's located on the long arm of chromosome 5, and that's called the TCOF1 gene, which just stands for Treacher Collins Franchetti 1. And this gene is transcribed and translated into a protein that's called Treacle, and Treacle produces ribosomal RNA. And during fetal development, this ribosomal RNA that's produced by Trico stabilizes a population of neural crest cells. And those neural crest cells that are stabilized by this rRNA ultimately are going to be the precursor cells that are involved in facial bones and tissues and also uh, involved in the facial nerve as well. So what this means is that if you lack this rRNA or you don't have enough, then these cells are going to uh, apoptose, and the result of that is that you're going to have a hypoplasia or a dysplasia of these facial bones and soft tissues. 60% of these mutations are de novo, and then the other 40% are inherited. So if you have a parent of a Treacher Collins patient who comes to you and they've had one child and that child had Treacher Collins syndrome, and they want to know what's the chance that my next child will have uh, this syndrome, the answer is you can't say without genetic testing. So if the parent carries the mutation, regardless of whether they look like they have Treacher Collins syndrome or not, then there's a 50-50% chance that the parent will have a child with Treacher Collins syndrome. If they don't, then the odds are just like for anybody else in the general population. Uh, what happened was that their first child develop the mutation on their own, and so any other children that they have are just as likely as anybody else, any other child, to develop that mutation, and that's, like we said, about 1 in 25 to 50,000 live births, so pretty low. All right, I think I've beaten this point enough that the, some of the cases are mild, so it's possible to carry the mutation but be un, uh, unaware at the same time. So what are these features? Particularly, you're going to be looking around the eyes and along the, uh, the zygoma and the temple and the ears. That's where you tend to see the most dramatic uh, features. So the palpebral fissures are uh, downward slanting, so you have a mongoloid slant, or sorry, anti-mongoloid slant. Um, and then they also tend to be very, very short, so you only have a very short aperture uh, for the eye. 
So just to look back on this, this young lady here, you can see that she has an anti-mongoloid slant. If you, draw, if you drew a line from the medial canthus to the lateral canthus, that line would not be parallel with the ground. So this is a, a downward slant. And you also see there's just very narrow apertures uh, for the eye from the lateral to medial canthus. Another thing you can see in about 70% of cases is a coloboma of the eyelid. Now this is not the same as a coloboma, which is generally referred to, usually re referring to a coloboma of the, of the iris. And that's like our little, uh, our little keyhole pupil, where you have that abnormally shaped pupil. This is a coloboma of the eyelid, which is similar in concept. It's just a little notch on the eyelid. I'll show you some pictures of that. You can also have deficiency of eyelashes, particularly on the lower lid. You'll have that in a majority of cases. And then there can also be impaired vision due to underdeveloped lateral orbit and uh, the external ocular muscles that are in that area. Uh, when you look at the ears, these tend to be very dramatic in appearance in a lot of cases. So you can have a malformed pinna. They tend to be low set, closer to where the temporomandibular joint would be. You can have uh, deficiencies, uh, abnormalities of the external auditory canal, uh, atresia, stenosis, meatal atresia. As a result of all these abnormalities of the ear, you can have conductive hearing loss, and that's, uh, that can be worsened by issues with, uh, with the malleus, incus, and stapes. You can also have ear tags and fistulas. So lots of different possibilities as far as abnormalities of the ear, but they're generally grossly abnormal. Uh, the nose tends to be spared. However, you can have coenal atresia. The nose can appear apparently larger. That's due to zygomatic underdevelopment. Uh, and then hypoplastic supraorbital ridges, so that can confer upon the nose an abnormal shape, but the nose in and of itself is typically normal. Inside the mouth and the throat, you can have a cleft palate. Uh, there can be pharyngeal hypoplasia. Mandibular angle is generally more obtuse. Uh, you can also have a retropositioned tongue uh, called glossoptosis, and this can affect the airway so this is important to, uh, to investigate. Um, you also will see this, uh, this trait in Pierre Robin sequence. Uh, there can also be difficulties with swallowing and feeding, and often there are, and uh, in many cases it necessitates uh, the need for uh, a gastrostomy tube. There's uh, supposedly an increased risk of, uh, of ASD and VSD, and there can also be dental problems as well. All right, so just kind of reacquainting ourselves with the facial bones. So you have the frontal bone right at the front, right? And then uh, inferior to that, you have articulations with the nasal bone over your nose with the maxilla, which makes up the upper part of your jaw. And then also with uh, this uh, peach bone, peach colored bone here, you can't really appreciate the actual shape. Um, but you have one on either side, and this is the uh, this is the zygomatic bone. And you can see that the zygomatic bone makes up the lateral capsules of the uh, orbit, um, the lateral walls of the orbit, and that's why there are uh, issues with the lateral rectus muscle uh, when uh, with, with the extraocular muscles. So there's issues with the lateral eye. Uh, the zygomatic bone articulates laterally uh, on the temporal bone, and then uh, what you can't really see here is the parietal bone. Uh, so this here in peach, the zygomatic bone, this tends to be the most affected. Okay, I'm turning around here. So here again is your zygomatic bone, and it articulates with the temporal bone. And then um, the temporal bone also articulates with the mandible, and this is your temporal mandibular joint, and this tends to be abnormal in treacher collins syndrome. So this is a cartoon of essentially what treacher collins syndrome looks like at the face. So uh, here you have uh, downward slanting palpebral fissures. They tend to be narrow. Uh, this is trying to illustrate a coloboma of the eyelid. Uh, it tends to be on the lower eyelid, and it's just this little notch. I got a much better picture that will show you what this looks like. Uh, hypoplasia of the zygomatic bones is a pretty salient feature. Um, it says uh, microtia, and that's mostly because you—it's uh, gonna—the eyes are gonna look small uh, 
many reasons because you have a narrower uh, aperture. You have narrower palpebral fissures. And then uh, you'll usually have a really small mandible. Okay, so here's a child with Treacher Cohen syndrome. So you note the downward slanting palpebral fissures. Uh, they're a little bit smaller. You don't see much of the whites of his eyes. That's a sign that you've probably got narrow palpebral fissures. Uh, you also see that he's got a very small jaw. You look at his ears, they're, uh, they're pretty low set, although it's kind of hard to see how abnormal these are. Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, his nose is a little large appearing, but that's not because there's anything wrong with the nose. It's just because this bone that should be right here um, and right here uh, is underdeveloped. And so the result of that is the eyes just kind of sag down where that bone should be. So this is a slightly older child. Again, you see that there's, uh, you have a lot of skin covering up where that bone should be. Uh, and then uh, the downward slanting Eyes, not a lot of eye whites here. The ears are uh, are down quite low, although uh, his external ear looks pretty normal. Uh, the the actual shape of it, they're just uh, low positioned. So now this child here has very uh, malformed ears. He's got a very 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 small chin. And uh, again, the nose looks kind of bulbous, but it's because there's this lack of zygomatic support here. And again, you see the downward slanted eyes. Now here he's grown up, and you can see that he looks a little bit more normal, uh, probably because he's had some surgery. This is a much more mild case. Uh, so you, again, though, you see the uh, slightly downward slanting eyes. Not so much of a uh, of narrow palpebral fissures here, though. Um, and then um, he does have a small mandible, and uh, ears are lowly set. So this is uh, before and after. Uh, you can see that this uh, young woman, again, has the downward slanting palpebral fissures. Uh, she's got uh, her nose is a little wider. Uh, her ears are down low, but it's kind of hard to appreciate that. From this side, you can see a little better here. Uh, if you look uh, from the uh, profile view, you can see she really doesn't have much of a chin at all. Now, after the surgery, you can see this is much more appropriate looking. Uh, this is much more normal looking, but you see before, she didn't really have much of a chin. You also see that she's got orthodontia, and that's pretty common. Uh, a lot of times there's dental issues with malocclusion in uh, children with Treacher Collins syndrome. So if she has braces, ultimately though she'll get them off, and she has nice straight teeth. So residually she still has some downward slanting of the eyes, uh, but uh, you can see that it's a much different appearance after the, uh, after the plastic surgery. This is a coloboma of the eyelid. So it's just a little notch on the eyelid. And you can also see that there is virtually no eyelashes of the lower eyelid. And this is characteristic of Treacher Collins syndrome. So here you can see that uh, not only are, is there dental crowding, uh, but you also have a bifid uvula, and that's, uh, that's not uncommon uh, in this syndrome as well. As far as development, uh, the face will continue to be abnormal without surgery. So these kids generally will necessitate surgery, um, if not for practical purposes like feeding and breathing, uh, for uh, cosmetic purposes. And that's usually why a lot of children get surgery, uh, understandably. Uh, feeding difficulties can lead to undernutrition, which can manifest as failure to thrive. Um, those children, though, will typically uh, go on to get a gastrostomy, and, uh, and that makes it a lot easier to, to feed them because you bypass the, uh, the pharynx. Otherwise, though, physical development's not affected. They're not going to be short stature. They're not going to be overweight. They're not going to uh, have any other issues with any other bones. It's, this is just in the face. Uh, cognitively, these children are normal, but a lot of them are going to require some kind of hearing aid. Uh, very early on, if they don't have uh, something to help them with hearing, uh, they won't learn to speak because a lot of them will be deaf, 
Uh, so you can either go one of two ways. You can get them fitted early on with implants or you can uh, have them learn to communicate early on through sign language. Uh, however, speech and language therapy is going to be invaluable for these children because uh, they only have a conductive hearing loss, so there are ways to help them hear. Uh, so speech and language therapy is going to be really useful to help them learn how to vocalize words. Uh, social development, really there's nothing wrong with these kids. Uh, adolescence and adulthood, typically these, uh, these people turn into normally functioning adults. They don't have any issues with cognition. They can typically take care of themselves, provided that uh, there's... Um, that they're able to eat appropriately and, and, uh, and that they're able to be up and about. Uh, but uh, there's nothing in the treacher Collins syndrome that's going to cause them to not be able to hold a job or uh, be able to function as adults. There may be some residual medical issues, but for the most part, these, pa these patients are able to take care of themselves. The diagnosis can really be highly suspected based on the clinical appearance. This has a very, very, uh, very um, unusual appearance relative to some of the other uh, uh, genetic deformities. Um, however, you should always get bone radiographs uh, in all directions. So I would get them at least uh, uh, AP and lateral radiographs. Um, presumptive diagnosis should always be confirmed with genetic testing, and the first uh, thing you're going to go after is the TCOF1 gene. Uh, so you should always confirm with genetic testing, but you can make your suspective diagnosis on the clinical appearance as well as the radiographs too. So for management, it's kind of complicated, uh, but we have to keep in mind the most important things first. So the number one concern is the patency of the airway. Remember with that retropositioned tongue, uh, there is a risk of, uh, of airway obstruction. So uh, to ensure a secure airway, a lot of times early on we'll have to do tracheostomy. You don't want to leave, uh, you don't want to leave a, a tube in for very long, so tracheostomy is, is generally how we, uh, how we start. Um, but uh, the, uh, the, it would be preferable to not have them on a tracheostomy if we don't have to. So I'm not saying you have to do a tracheostomy, uh, but you need to ensure a secure airway, and this is typically how it's done. Uh, for feeding, they will usually require a gastrostomy tube, and the nice thing about these two things is they can both be maintained at home. Uh, pediatric surgery referral, since I didn't mention, uh, is absolutely mandatory, or these children can be uh, referred over to a specialized craniofacial center. Uh, apart from these, uh, these basic steps to uh, maintain well-being, uh, you'll also want to look for a cleft palate. If there is a cleft palate, that should be repaired by a surgeon at one to two years of age. You should look for coenal atresia. You can pass a catheter through the nose and, uh, and then take an x-ray. Uh, and uh, if that catheter is in the stomach and you don't meet resistance, uh, then you don't have coenal atresia. Uh, if there is, however, this should be repaired immediately. You should also monitor uh, or, uh, or screen their hearing uh, through uh, any kind of audiometric uh, evaluation that you have at your disposal. Uh, just remember, because these children do have about 50% of them are going to be deaf. Uh, pediatric ophthalmology evaluation is useful just because of the abnormalities of the eye, and then a craniofacial CT can be useful for the surgeon. As well, so this this is just sort of your basic initial management. Long term, you're going to have a lot of professionals on the team. So of course, you're going to have your pediatric plastic surgeon or craniofacial specialist. You want to have ENT involved, oral surgery because there are a lot of dental issues with this. Medical geneticist, speech language therapist, an audiologist, pediatric dentist, an orthodontist, educational specialist. Ultimately, as these children uh, transition to school. Most of the time, they're going to need to be in a hearing impaired class, but ultimately, we like to get them um, transitioned into the regular uh, school just because these kids are not cognitively behind. Uh, so we, we don't like them to be in any kind of special ed because uh, these kids have just as much learning potential as, uh, as non-affected children. And then genetic counseling is going to be useful uh, especially for the parents, because there is a 40% chance that this was 
uh, transmitted to their child genetically through their own genes, uh, but also for the child because these, uh, these patients are going to ultimately be fertile, and so they need to be uh, counseled on their risks, which is 50% of transmitting uh, their syndrome onto their offspring. Long term, many patients are going to require several reconstructive surgeries during childhood to prevent the progression of facial symmetry. And while sign language is a good way to communicate with the child early on, two, three, four years old, a speech language therapist is invaluable for training the child to speak more clearly despite any anatomic barriers that can be there. And the speech may not be very clear, but this Working with a, a speech-language therapist will help the child express themselves more clearly because remember, not everybody knows sign language. Uh, and then with proper management, life expectancy really is expected to be around that of the general population.